Welcome to Cryptids Unveiled. If you haven't seen the intro and the episode on Bigfoot, make sure you check those out as it all connects. If you're enjoying these episodes in the channel, then do us a favor and click that notification bell and change it to all so that you won't miss one thing happening on the channel. YT isn't too fond of these videos, so even telling a friend truly helps us out. Now in this episode, we're going to be talking about Dogman, and many have insisted that this may be a joke or that it is but a spiritual occurrence. As strange and odd that it may seem to the modern human, throughout history there are countless accounts told of dog-headed peoples who lived in faraway lands. This phenomena is referred to as Sinocephaly, and almost all of us have seen a depiction of a Sinocephalus at some point in our lives. The literal meaning of Sinocephaly is dog-headed. The best example that we have all heard of is the Egyptian god Anubis, the god of mummification and the afterlife. You can find this depiction in many Egyptian artworks. It has a human body and the head of a jackal. This is an example of a Sinocephaly. Of course, we have been told that this is just a myth or a legend, but what if there is a story that has been systematically suppressed so we aren't made aware that there are indeed other intelligent variations of the human form? Throughout history, there are many descriptions of these creatures, referenced by explorers all the way up to modern times. They have been described in detail by Alexander the Great, St. Augustine, Christopher Columbus, and Marco Polo. One of the oldest depictions of a Sinocephalus is in the deserts of western Libya, on the cliffs and boulders along the edge of a dry riverbed called Wadi Mentendush. Our rock carvings cut by a culture making the jump from hunter-gathering to a nomadic pastoral farming around 4,000 years ago. Possibly recut many times, their carvings show animals in a Libya before the Sahara arrived. Giraffes and elephants are accurately depicted. One carving shows two dog-headed men dragging away the body of a rhino, or possibly using magic to control it. Some of the first known written accounts of these beasts come from the Greek physician Tasius who described his travels from India and all the strange beings he saw there. One of these beings being the Sinocephalus. Seems a little bit too detailed to be just a myth. Quote, On these mountains there live men with the head of a dog, whose clothing is the skin of wild beasts. They speak no language, but bark like dogs, and in this manner make themselves understood by each other. Their teeth are larger than those of dogs, their nails like those of these animals, but longer and rounder. They inhabit the mountains as far as the river Indus. Their complexion is swarthy. They are extremely just, like the rest of the Indians with whom they associate. They understand the Indian language, but are unable to converse, only barking or making signs with their hands and fingers by way of reply, like the deaf and dumb. They are called by the Indians Calistri, in Greek Sinocephali. Note, they live on raw meat, and they number around 120,000. The Sinocephali living on the mountains do not practice any trade, but live by hunting. When they have killed an animal, they roast it in the sun. They also rear numbers of sheep, goats, and asses, drinking the milk of the sheep and whey made from it. They eat the fruit of the Siptokhora, whence amber is procured since it is sweet. They also dry it and keep it in baskets, as the Greeks keep their dried grapes. They make rafts which they load with this fruit together with well-cleaned purple flowers and 260 talents of amber, with the same quantity of the purple dye and thousands of additional talents of amber, which they send annually to the king of India. They exchange the rest for bread, flour, and cotton stuffs with the Indians from whom they also buy swords for hunting wild beasts, bows, and arrows, being very skillful in drawing the bow and hurling the spear. They cannot be defeated in war since they inhabit lofty and inaccessible mountains. Every five years, the king sends them a present of 300,000 bows, as many spears, 120,000 shields, and 50,000 swords. They do not live in houses, but in caves. They set out for the chase with bows and spears, and as they are very swift of foot, they pursue and soon overtake their quarry. The women have a bath once a month then men do not have a bath at all, 
but only wash their hands. They anoint themselves three times a month with oil made from milk and wipe themselves with skins. The clothes of men and women are alike, are not skins with the hair on, but skins tanned and very fine. The riches wear linen clothes, but they are few in number. They have no beds, but sleep on leaves or grass. He who possesses the greatest number of sheep is considered the riches, and so in regard to their other possessions, all both men and women have tails above their hips like dogs, but longer and more hairy. They are just and live longer than any other men, 170, sometimes 200 years. Another detailed account is from Roman author Claudius Aelian in his 17 book series on the nature of animals. And notice how again they are talking about India. And in the same part of India as the beetles are born the dog heads as they are called a name which they owe to their physical appearance and nature. For the rest they are of a human shape and go about clothed in the skin of beasts, and they are upright and injure no man, and though they have no speech, they howl, yet they understand the Indian language. Wild animals are their food, and they catch them with the utmost ease, for they are exceedingly swift of foot, and when they have caught them, they kill and cook them, not over a fire, but by exposing them to the sun's heat after they have shredded them into pieces. They also keep goats and sheep, and while their food is the flesh of wild beasts, their drink is the milk of the animals they keep. I have mentioned along with the brute beast, as is logical, for their speech is inarticulate, unintelligible, and not that of man. Notice the consistency between these two different accounts. Alexander the Great invaded India in the 4th century BC, he too claimed in his letters to his teacher, Aristotle, that he had encountered the dog-headed men. Alexander the Great even claimed to have captured several of the creatures in battle, which he said were fierce and vicious, barking and snarling beasts. Around 450 BC, Greek historian Herodotus stated, quote, For the eastern side of Libya, where the wanderers dwell, is low and sandy as far as the river Triton. But westward of that, the land of the husbandmen is very hilly, and abounds with forest and wild beasts. Here too are the dog-faced creatures, and the creatures without heads, whom the Libyans declare to have their eyes and their breasts. Pliny the Elder states, quote, According to Megasthenes, on a mountain called Nulo, there live men whose feet are turned backwards, and who have eight toes on each foot while on many of the mountains where lives a race of men having heads like those of dogs, who are clothed with the skins of wild beasts, whose speech is barking, and who, being armed with claws, live by hunting and fowling. Philosopher, theologian, and later St. Augustine said, quote, What shall I say of the Sinocephali, whose dog-like head and barking proclaim them beasts rather than men, but we are not bound to believe all we hear of these monstrosities. But whoever is anywhere born a man, that is, a rational, mortal animal, no matter what the unusual appearance he presents in color, movement, sound, nor how peculiar he is in some power, part, or quality of his nature, no Christian can doubt that he springs from that one protoplast. We can distinguish the common human nature from that which is peculiar and therefore wonderful. Italian traveler and the first to document the Mongol Empire, Giovanni Carpini, documented an encounter between the armies of Ogedai Khan and a dog-headed people near Lake Baikal. Quote, from hence they proceeded towards the north against the people called Bastarsi or Hungary Magna and conquered them also. And so going on further north, they came onto the Parasite who having little stomachs and small mouths, eat nothing at all, but seething flesh they stand or sit over the pot, and receiving the steam or smoke thereof, are therewith only nourished, and if they eat anything it is very little. From hence they came to the Samogete, who live only upon hunting, and used to dwell in tabernacles only, and to wear garments made of bee's skin. From thence they proceeded into a country lying upon the ocean sea, where they found certain monsters, who in all things resembled the sheep of men, saving that their feet were like the feet of an ox, and they had indeed men's head, but dogs' faces. 
They spake as it were two words like men, but the third they bark like dogs. From hence they retired into Comania, and there some of them remain unto this day. An Italian monk by the name of Orderic of Pordenon, who traveled about converting people from 1317 and 1330, claimed to have come across the Sinocephali at the island of Nicoveran. They were described as being somewhat brutish, but displaying a form of organized religion, worshipping oxen and wearing various gold and silver religious charms. French Inquisitor Cardinal Pierre claimed in 1410 that there existed a race of dog-headed humans in India, as well as a one-eyed variation of the creatures referred to as Caris Maspi. Explorer Giovanni de Pion del Carpin also mentions a race of dog heads which he claimed inhabited the lands north of the Dailinor Northern Ocean and Lake Bakai. Indeed, depictions of the Sinocephali appeared on maps of the time, similar to the dragons and other wondrous beasts that map makers like to adorn their maps with. There are references to dog headed humans called Samukhas in Indian traditions. Varahamahira, in his Brat Samhita, gives us some interesting information in this area. Geography of India, the interesting thing is that the people were named after their appearance. The Vagramukhas, tiger face, the Danturikas, people with protruding teeth, Asavadanas, horse faced, Valagrivas, serpent necked, Serpakarnas, ears like winnowing basket, Urdhavakanthas, high necked ones, Smas Rudharas, the bearded ones, Mahagrivas, long necked ones, and several other names, but the doll peoples are called Samukhas. In Chinese lore, Huainan Su was viewed for its great diversity of subject matter, ideas, and style, and remains a notable work in Taoist literature. Here we can find other ancient mentions of the dog headed peoples. Quote, more than a thousand li east of Fusang, itself to be more than 20,000 li to the east of the northeasternmost country known to the Chinese, that is, the kingdom of women, Nu Kuo. These women are beautifully shaped and of a pure white color. Their body is hairs, and the hair of their heads is so long that it trails to the ground. In the second or third moon, they eagerly enter into the water and become pregnant, and give birth to children in the sixth or seventh moon. These women have no breast on the chest, but at the nape of the neck, hair grows on white stems, and in these hairs is a juice which with they suckle their children. A man named Chin An, while crossing the sea, was blown adrift by the wind to an island and went ashore. People lived there. The women were like those of China, although their language could not be understood. The men had human bodies, but dog heads, and their voice was a sort of barking. They built up walls of the earth of a round shape, the door of which was like a dog entrance. This also reminds me of the petroglyph in Tool River in California, with the legend of creation having to do with a wild man and between a coyote. There are many creation myths associated with dogs. Is there a hidden meaning to the word dog? or God spelled backwards? Now for the most convincing part of Dogman or Sinocephaly history, Saint Christopher, our patron saint of travelers, is traditionally held to have come from an obscure North African Berber tribe called the Marmorite, was captured in battle by the Romans in 300 AD. He was believed to be a Sinocephalus, accepted baptism, and then seemingly began to preach the gospel ultimately getting himself sainted. Eastern Orthodox iconology frequently depicts St. Christopher with a dog's head, at least until the 18th century. The crazy thing about this is, this would be seen as blasphemy for representing a saint in such a derogative way by describing them as a dog. This must be the literal depiction of what he looked like. We know the church seeked out paganism with a diligence, so then why would they be trying to do some occult meaning like the Egyptian hieroglyphs with these paintings? It seems as if this is a depiction of his true appearance. Now that's just one side of the history, and there are more accounts, but those are the most famous ones. But it doesn't stop there. 
this topic gets deeper once you consider werewolves. Lycanthropy and cynocephaly are connected, but very different. Cynocephalus are described as a race of beings that truly existed at one point in time, with about 200,000 of them just in India. Lycanthropy is the supernatural transformation of a person into a wolf, as recounted in folktales and lore. But the big difference is that lycanthropy has a more negative connotation and is associated with black magic and curses. The earliest surviving example of man-to-wolf transformation is found in the Epic of Gilgamesh. The earliest surviving example of man-to-wolf transformation, which also could be perceived as a wild man transformation, is found in the Epic of Gilgamesh. However, the werewolf as we now know it first appeared in ancient Greece and Rome in ethnographic, poetic, and philosophical texts. In the mainstream timeline of 425 BC, Greek historian Herodotus described the Nuri, a nomadic tribe of magical men who changed into wolf shapes for several days of the year. The Nuri were from Scythia, or ancient Tartaria, and were known to have to wear wolf skins in their traditions. The werewolf myth became integrated with the local history of Arcadia, a region of Greece. Here, Zeus was worshipped by Lycian Zeus, Wolf Zeus. In 380 BC from our modern timeline, Greek philosopher Plato told a story in the Republic about the protector-turned-tyrant of the shrine of Lycian Zeus. In this short passage, the character Socrates remarks, the story goes that he who tastes of the one bit of human entrails minced up with those of other victims is inevitably transformed into a wolf. According to the legend, Lycon, the son of Pelasgus, angered the god Zeus when he served him a meal made from the remains of a sacrificed boy. As punishment, the enraged Zeus turned Lycon and his sons into wolves. Werewolves also emerged in early Nordic folklore. The saga of the Volsongs tells the story of a father and son who discovered wolf pelts that had the power to turn people into wolves for 10 days. The father-son duo donned the pelts, transformed into wolves, and went on a killing rampage in the forest. The rampage ended when the father attacked his son, causing a lethal wound. The son only survived because a kind raven gave the father a leaf with healing powers. Many werewolves from centuries ago were known vicious killers. In 1521, Frenchmen Pierre Bergat and Michael Verdun allegedly swore allegiance to the devil and claimed to have an ointment that turned them into wolves. After confessing to brutally murdering several children, they were both burned to death at the stake. Giles Garner, known as the Werewolf of Dole, was another 16th century Frenchman whose claim to fame was also an ointment with wolf morphing abilities. According to the legend, as a wolf he viciously killed children and ate them. He too was burned to death at the stake for his monstrous crimes. I remember that there was a story from the Brendan Solomon's channel that spoke of a man with a black oil that could transform into this type of being. Peter Stubb, a wealthy 15th century farmer in Bedburg, Germany, may be the most notorious werewolf of them all. According to folklore, he turned into a wolf-like creature at night and devoured many citizens of Bedburg. Peter was eventually blamed for the gruesome killings after being cornered by hunters who claimed they saw him shapeshift from wolf to human form. He experienced a grisly execution after confessing under torture to savagely killing animals, men, women, and children, and eating their remains. He also declared he owned an enchanted belt that gave him the power to transform into a wolf at will. Legends maintain werewolves shapeshifted at will due to a curse. Others state they transformed with the help of an enchanted sash or a cloak made of wolf pelt. And then we all know about turning into wolves after being scratched or bit by a werewolf. The werewolf legend is a global legend. Everywhere you look, you may find this story integrated into the folklore. From Europe, to Africa, to Asia, even in Native American legends in North and South America, you will find this concept of shape-shifting into a beast. Theus of Kaltenbrunn, 
and commonly referred to as the Livonian Werewolf, was a Livonian man who was put on trial for heresy in Durensburg, Swedish Livonia in 1692. The Armenian Werewolf is pretty creepy, always a sinful woman condemned to spend the nights over seven years as a wolf. She first eats her own children, then stalks other villages, where doors and locks spontaneously open as she approaches. In Africa, one legend went that a man was able to transform himself into a lion, living for months at a time in a sacred hut in the forest. Let's not forget Red Riding Hood and the wolf that ate the grandma, was likely referring to a werewolf instead of a cynocephalus. For such vicious behavior and themes of transformation from the earlier versions. These early variations of the tale do differ from the currently known version in several ways. The antagonist is not always a wolf, but sometimes a zao or werewolf, making these tales relevant to the werewolf trials of the time. The wolf usually leaves the grandmother's blood and flesh for the girl to eat who then unwittingly cannibalizes her own grandmother. Furthermore, the wolf was also known to ask her to remove her clothing and toss it into the fire. In some versions, the wolf eats the girl after she gets into bed with him and the story ends there. The wolf and the three little pigs. Again, the wolf is referred to as the big bad wolf, yet is this a reference to some magical vicious monster that is attempting to eat the domesticated animal and the only way to protect against them is by building brick? Is it possible that there's something deeper to this story? Vedic lore has an interesting take on this as well, but I wonder if this is a reference to possession of another animal through magical means. One social group within the Indian classificatory system were swapakas or the dog cookers, dog milkers, and or dog people, with the sa meaning dog, pa to cook, and pa nourish or suckle, thus the sapakas were a race of people nourished of dogs, suckled by dogs, or children of dogs. A comprehensive account of the Indian dog cooker or dog milker is found in the Mahabharata. Yudhisthira asked the slowly dying Bhima the way which a king ought to rule in times when all living on earth has become dashified, and when time has arrived at a low point, in answer to his question, Bhisma relates to him the story of Visvamitra and the village of the dog cookers. Now this is a long myth, but to summarize it, basically Visvamitra and many others seem to be going through some cataclysm phase or very hard times, and he has nothing else to eat but dog meat. He is warned by a Chandala or Kandala, who is someone who deals with corpses about not eating the dog for you shouldn't mix in the caste based system. They aren't talking about races here, they're talking about different spiritual caste levels. The Kandala asked, Who is pawing and restraining me? And the Visvamitra said that he is starved and he must eat of the dog's hindquarters in order to live. Visvamitra was a sage participating in lower matters. In the end, he was warned and still decided to do it so that he could live. But this myth is associated with a curse and all of his sons were cursed to be dog eaters for a thousand years. In Chinese literature, the Sheng Nu may themselves have been descended from a dog or wolf if we were to trust the accounts given by the Chinese. Indeed, there is a full tale to the effect that the Sheng Nu named Tan Yu, father, begat two daughters who were so beautiful that people took them for goddesses. Tan Yu said, with these daughters, how can I find husbands good enough for them? I'll present them to heaven. So he built a tall tower in the north of the country where no one lived and put his two girls on top of it, saying, I invite heaven to receive them. After a year, an old wolf, Lang, came and prowled about the base of the tower in the deep of the night and howled. The young daughter said, O oh, father, put us here in order to present us to heaven. Now that this wolf has come, perhaps it is a divine being sent by heaven. And with this, she started to climb down. Her elder sister cried, That's a wild animal, not fit to become a mother-in-law with. 
but the younger girl disregarded her words and descended to become the wolf's wife. She gave birth to a son. In later times, this progeny multiplied into a whole country. The lupine myth of the Turks, from the secret history of the Mongols, opens with these lines. The Wasa bluish wolf, or Bortocino, which was born having his destiny from heaven above, his spouse was a wild she-dog, Koai Maral. In later versions, you have Genghis Khan saying himself that he was descended from the union of Alankoa, a human woman and a shining yellow man who, when he moved, resembled a dog. This canine ancestry myth is quite popular in this area such as with the Siberian peoples. All very strange indeed, but does the Bible have anything to say about werewolves? Daniel 4.33 Immediately, the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar, who was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird claws. Matthew 7.15 Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So now we're going to move on to more modern examples, and as you guys heard in the intro, people are still experiencing these things till this day. They seem quite evil and not friendly. That's just one story from the intro of the many thousands all over the internet. This is not just a product of the imagination, but people are seeing something. The Michigan Dogman was allegedly witnessed in 1887 by two lumberjacks in Wexford County, Michigan. The creature is described as a 7 foot tall, blue eyed or amber eyed, bipedal canine like animal with the torso of a man and a fearsome howl that sounds like a human scream. According to the legends, the Michigan Dogman appears in a 10 year cycle that falls in years ending in 7. There are countless stories online about this from the people who experienced it, and one of the biggest ones is Dogman Encounters. Their dedicated website states, which some followers have mentioned could be a CIA cover-up to collect data on the matter, but we have no idea. On their website, it says that the truth is being kept under wraps, but most eyewitnesses who possess that kind of evidence don't want it released to the public. Amazing videos, Pictures and vocals of dogmen have all been shared with me. Impressive dogman evidence most definitely does exist. Well, he does have some audio on his site that is quite interesting. Decide for yourself. It is said that there are more reports of the Michigan Dogman than there are of Bigfoot. Now we move to the Beast of Bray Road, also known as the Bray Road Beast and the Wisconsin Werewolf, is a purported humanoid wolf-like creature allegedly witnessed in or near the rural community of Elkhorn, Walworth County, Wisconsin. The Beast of Bray Road is most often described by alleged witnesses as a large, between 6 feet and 7 feet tall, with a humanoid style body, covered in fur or hair, and with a head resembling a wolf or a bear. The creature was allegedly first sighted in 1936. In the 1980s, several alleged witnesses reported the beast had made contact with their vehicles, leaving long scratch marks on doors and trunks of vehicles. One witness reported hitting something crossing Bray Road, then exited their vehicle to determine what they had hit and reported that a large wolf-like creature with red eyes chased her back into the car and left claw marks in the rear passenger door. Sightings also have been reported during daylight hours, with several witnesses stating that they observed an unusually large wolf-like creature running on all fours through the cornfields. One witness stated they observed the creature in pursuit of a deer. Then you have the Native American legends of the Skinwalker, where many tribes talk about these dark magicians who would undergo a werewolf-esque transformation at night, morphing into animals such as wolves, coyotes, foxes, owls, and more. 
and despite their naturally bloodthirsty nature, they must kill other people to survive. Some stories talk about this ash from burning human remains and then coating their entire body with this substance. And this gets connected with Skinwalker Ranch in this episode as well. It connects back to the weirdness associated with the subject in terms of this involving of multiple dimensions and being something connected to multiple planes of existence at the same time. There were descriptions of these rare shape-shifting wolves on the ranch. Maybe these beings are both physical and astral depending on the location and the environment. Supposedly, the Navajo are believed to have cursed the land the property sits on after being mistreated by the Ute tribe. As we look at the conclusion and similar themes, it may be too deep to delve into for this video, but this ties together with another future video that will elaborate on monstrous races and or hybrid races. These are mentioned by the same authors who talk about these dog-headed creatures or cynocephali, that they belong to a class of spiritual animals that are above animals but below humans, so they're quite intelligent. This gets into animal creation myths, Genesis and the Fallen Ones and their genetic manipulation of mankind over the ages, or perhaps children of the Fallen Ones who developed advanced technology formed a breakaway civilization and have been looking over us over these ages. We tend to believe that this is more than just a supernatural occurrence. Sure, there are many instances where these beings live on the astral realm as demons you could say, and there are instances where black magicians are using different necromancy techniques to transform and shapeshift into other beings, usually involving some type of sacrifice. The concept of a curse and the ages that follow from just one member committing blasphemy. As we saw from the Vedic literature of Visvamitra and how he mixed the different caste systems by being a sage or brahmin and participating in such a lowly act as eating the flesh of a dog. He was cursed and for a thousand years, his lineage was cursed to eat dogs. This grew into other forms of curses such as with lichen and being turned into a werewolf from some magical item and or from being scratched by a previous werewolf, and being forced to change into a beast at the full moon. You also as well have this black magic and the ability to transform into other animals through ritual or through some oil or force through some curse. So there's definitely some spiritual stuff, especially if you consider Missing 411, Skinwalker Ranch, and the idea that these forests are antennae for paranormal events and or connections with other realities. But now that we know the accounts of the ancients, is it possible that the Sinocephalus is in fact a real being of history and they were hunted out but they still exist in small amounts and have resulted in becoming savages in order to survive? We also have to consider military genetic experiments in which these beings were designed for becoming super soldiers. They have alluded to experiments with cryptids in movies, such as the cabin. Perhaps there was a mistake and these beings got loose into the wilderness. It does seem in the stories that these seem to be evil, possibly spiritual beings. Maybe these dogman occurrences aren't exactly the Sinocephalus, but maybe something deeper involving satanic involvement. Whatever the case, there are these constant themes of military cover-ups and sound devices made to specifically target higher frequencies that can only be heard by dogs and not humans. If you remember from the introduction episode, I've heard this in other stories as well, but they have this like satellite disc type gun weapon that they use to take down these beings. If the majority of humanity knew these monsters existed, it would cause chaos in our modern society. The whole idea is they need order out of chaos, and maybe they feel that they have a good reason for erasing these beings from our knowledge. This is kind of like Shrek, right, where they wanted to get rid of all the magical beings in the kingdom. The beings that still have a connection from the last age are perhaps still not fully physical and have powers that we have lost. They don't want us to know about these beings because it would imply a spiritual reality and a creationist occult version of reality. When they want to teach you an atheist, 
evolutionary ideology. Cryptids do not fall into their world paradigm, and the truth is, any of these atheists were ever in a live or die situation in front of one of these beings, they would immediately pray to God out of fear. There is so much that hasn't been told to us, and it's our responsibility to stay curious and question the mainstream narrative. As long as we stay diligent and continue to ask questions, all we can hope is that our minds may be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?